On September 16, 2015, Trappist was scheduled to watch a very faint red dwarf star just 40 light years away. But that night, a powerful earthquake struck northern Chile. The Trappist telescope was in one of the worst affected areas, but it was built to withstand seismic events. When there is a certain level of earthquake, the first thing that happens is that the telescope is going to stop functioning. The observation uh, stopped and uh, the dome was closed in safe mode. And then the, the morning, my student noticed the situation and she relaunched the observation of the star. The telescope wasn't damaged, but by the time it was working again, the night was nearly over and there were only three hours left to observe the target star before dawn. Back in Europe, Mikhail was analyzing the data when something caught his eye. I was at home in my sofa with my laptop and I saw a very clear transit-like signal. And so I was super, super excited. And furthermore, I, know, I knew that the star was small, so the planet should have been more or less the size of the Earth. 40 light years away, an Earth-sized planet had passed in front of its dwarf star, and the earthquake almost caused Mikhail and his team to miss it. The Trappist telescope had made its first discovery of an Earth-sized planet, a huge achievement. The system was named Trappist-1 in its honor, but as they continued to watch, it soon became clear that this was not the regular signal you'd expect from a single planet. One planet should lead to one frequency, one period. It should be something like deet, 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 deet. You looked at the data and it's something like this. So it's totally different. That could mean only one thing, more planets. But to find out how many, Mikhail needed more observations. Observatories all over the world, including the very large telescope, swung their gaze towards the Trappist-1 star. And the results were groundbreaking. And we observed plenty and plenty of nights with plenty of plenty of transit. And uh, at some point, we are sure there were four planets and five planets, then maybe six, maybe seven. In fact, it, it was really too complex for us to, to decipher because we were observing from the ground, from Earth, and we knew we needed very precise observation and continuous observation. The only way to get a clear enough picture of the red dwarf star would be to view it from space. Telescopes beyond Earth are few and far between, so time on them is limited. But as news spread of this extraordinary discovery, every resource was soon put at their disposal, including one of NASA's four great observatories, the Spitzer Space Telescope. Astronomer Sean Carey runs NASA's Spitzer Science Center in California. So this is a model of the Spitzer Space Telescope. It's a one-third scale model, so add two more of these on top, then you get a sense of how big the telescope is in space. Spitzer was the perfect instrument to gather more information about TRAPPIST-1. First, it's an infrared telescope, so the TRAPPIST-1 star is 4,000 times brighter in the infrared than it is in visible light. The second thing is Spitzer's orbit, because Spitzer isn't on the Earth, so it doesn't have day night. You know, we don't have to stop observing when the sun comes up, and that allows us to look at objects for a much longer time. The space telescope watched the TRAPPIST star for over 20 continuous days and nights. So these are images from Spitzer of TRAPPIST-1, and believe it or not, what you're looking at is the data that we were used to determine the number of planets around TRAPPIST-1 and help us determine their properties. So if you measure the amount of light from the star and then plot that as a function of time, this is what astronomers do, you see these dips because that's when a planet passes in front of the star. When we saw this, that was, uh, that was a very happy morning when we made this plot. Scientists around the world raced to decipher the signal. 
So we analyzed the data as soon as they, they came from, from space. And the conclusion that there were seven planets was inescapable. My best hope would have been to detect one planet. So this system of seven planets came out of the blue as a total surprise and really like winning the lottery. Uh, so a cosmic lottery. Planet hunter extraordinaire, Michael Gion, had made an historic discovery, armed with a remarkably small telescope. But this was just the beginning of the story. Since the historic discovery of the seven Earth-sized planets that surround the Trappist star, scientists have been piecing together the data, learning more about these alien worlds, and giving a glimpse of how they might look from a neighboring planet. The system is unique not only by the sheer number of Earth-sized planets, but also because of its very compact configuration. The planets are very close to each other. So you can imagine the views that you should have from the surface of one of these planets. You would see the other planets like we see the moon. So you would see all the details, not just a dot of light, but you would really uh, see uh, I don't know, the cloud, the continents, whatever is there. As well as the planets being near each other, they are also much closer to their star known as TRAPPIST-1A. The inner two planets, TRAPPIST-1b and 1c, are in a danger zone, over 60 times closer to the red dwarf star than the Earth is to the Sun. From the surface of its nearest planet, TRAPPIST-1 would appear 10 times bigger than the sun looks to us here on Earth, it would be red and heating the surface to a temperature that is well above the boiling temperature of water. So it would be extremely hot on a sunny day out there. Harvard professor Avi Loeb has studied how stars can affect nearby planets. The inner two Trappist worlds are so close to the red dwarf that one side of each planet is thought to be gravitationally locked to always face its sun, meaning one hemisphere would be continuously blasted by intense radiation, while the other is trapped in perpetual darkness. One side of the planet that is facing the star would be so hot that liquid water would boil off the surface. The other side would be extremely cold such that if there is any water there, it would become ice. In between the two regions, there is a permanent sunset strip from which one can always see the sunset. 